Welcome to the Safety Share, a webinar series brought to you by CIM Magazine and the Health and Safety Society. I am your organizer, Michelle Beacom, Managing Editor of CIM Magazine. Today's presentation is Enhancing Safety in Underground Mining, Ground Control Theory and Best Practices. And it is sponsored by B2Gold. Thank you everyone for joining us today. We are excited to be partnering with the Health and Safety Society of CIM to be able to bring this series to you. Now, just a little housekeeping before we get started. Uh, to ensure you have optimal audio, if you joined by a computer, make sure you've selected the computer audio button. If you dialed in on, on the phone, please make sure you've selected the phone button. If you have questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in your GoToWebinar control panel. The questions will be held until the Q&A period after the presentation. Note that we will have questions during, poll questions during the presentation, so pay attention. I'm very happy to have John Treen with us, both to host today and to help make this series happen. John is president of Automate Mining and is a practice speaker and advocate for safety and incident prevention through design. Welcome, John. Thanks, Michelle. I appreciate the opportunity, and this is gonna be a, a great webinar with the team we've got here today. Uh, I also wanna thank everybody just for joining in. And for anybody that's binging all the seasons of uh, the Safety Share, we welcome you as well, too. This is season two and episode two for those keeping track. Uh, you know, one of the focuses that we've always had is significant incidents and re reducing those in the mines. And so today's topic, you know, of, of ground control practices and techniques and best practices is going to be, you know, tremendously valuable. So let's move right into it and, and introduce the panel we have for you today. Um, first, I'd like to introduce... Uh, Dr. Kathy Kalinchuk. Kathy's the president of Rock Engineering, um, and she'll take the diverse experience she has of over 100 different uh, mines and mining projects around the world, bring that all together and sort of give you her best experiences, some practices, and some shares that she can give. So we look forward to, to all Kathy has to share on this. Also from Rock Engineering, we have Anna Perry. Anna has a master's in science uh, from Queen's University and has spent much time also like Kathy around the world, but some time specifically down in the Carlin Trend in Elko, Nevada, where ground conditions are much different than uh, in many of the Canadian shield areas that we're used to. And, and that experience, we look forward to uh, having lots of valuable input uh, there. And then finally wrapping us up is Ryan Lyle. Ryan's with Cementation, um, and he also has a, a great variety of experience. Ryan is fortunately has experience in consulting, in operations, and also in contracting. And so he'll be able to go right from, you know, designs to implementations to how the mine uses it. Um, and so this team is gonna be very, very useful. Um, and Ryan's diversity also brings a little bit of, of salt mining to it. So we look forward to the entire panel and all that they're gonna share with us today. Um, so as we go through it, any questions you have, please type it in the question spots. We're going to have a, a bit of a panel discussion, but always some of the most exciting things are the discussions that happen at the end of it. And so please feel free to ask questions as we go along. We'll ask them all at the end, but you can type them as we go along and we'll, we'll open it up at the end. But we might as well jump right into it and, uh, and let's just go into you know, what, what we can do to help the overall safety in mining from a ground controlled and a rock mechanics perspective. You know, if we look back through some of the injuries that take place in the industry, falls of ground is one of the leading causes of fatal injuries within the industry. And, you know, so we really need to figure out what we can do. And there's, there's many challenges that we, that we encounter when we try to implement different measures within mining operations, specifically for ground support. Um, and so maybe to start this, and I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Are, are there any specific examples that you'd like to just discuss and measures that were put in place to solve some issues that, that you're familiar with or that the industry might have you know, come encounter with? Oh, th thank you, John. I, I can think of multiple challenges I've either seen or experienced personally that, that led to difficulty implementing ground control measures and can list some example solutions that, that I've seen that are effective to mitigate them. But the first one I can think of in terms of major challenges is related to high turnover in ground control departments, especially understaffed ones. 
So specific challenges I've seen related to this include that this often results in inconsistent policies in terms of your ground control program, as well as a loss of institutional knowledge. Further, effective ground control often takes years to learn, unlike some of the other roles in a mining engineering department, but it's often pretty common for people to only stay in this role for, for a year or so before being rotated elsewhere in the department or deciding that they want to go to a different site. So some examples of solutions that, that I've seen that, that can be effective for for these types of challenges include increasing the, the overall size of your ground control team to ensure that there's overlap and knowledge transfer if someone leaves. Like for, for example, I, I've worked at a couple different sites where when I started, there, there were only two ground control engineers. And I think by the time I left, the, the department had gotten up to eight. And that this was partially due, due to a, an increase in workload, but it also ensured that there was some overlap if someone left. The, the second potential solution I've seen is the increased use of seconded corporate engineers or consultants with prior knowledge of the site when a turnover occurs. However, as a caveat, in order for this solution to be effective, the, the site would need to maintain the same consultant or have involvement from the same corporate person. Otherwise, the, there would be no knowledge transfer um, if this was required. So, um, it, it's okay if I, I give a couple different examples. Um, a set, yeah, yeah a please. Chapter. Okay. I, I can think of contributing to site ground control challenges is somewhat similar and what is caused by a lack of experience within a ground control team. So the, this occurs because many mining engineers at sites are often early career. Um, like I, I see lots of young faces in their 20s and early, early 30s at sites. And all too often, there, there's not enough experienced personnel at the sites to train them. So challenges that could be caused by this include that inexperienced personnel may not know how to develop and execute an effective ground control program. So some example solutions that, that I can think of for, for these types of issues include the, the sites trying to provide career development opportunities for, for their ground control team as much as possible. So that this may include conducting trainings, um, let, letting their, their engineers attend technical conferences, as well as short-term secondments to, to other sites so that their engineers can, can see how things are done elsewhere. Um, similarly, the, the use of consultants or corporate ground control groups to support, train, and mentor the, the inexperienced engineers at sites as well as creating a network either with, with other sites or externally for, for inexperienced engineers to ask for help when they're unsure of something. So, so some examples I've seen, um, what, when I worked for Newmont previously, we, we had an internal gr ground control group where we would meet once a month. And um, by, by this, I, I was able to meet the, the other ground control engineers at, at the company so I could reach out if, if I needed help and they had similar issues, as well as utilizing external resources. Um, so for example, Work Workplace Safety North um, could, could provide this kind of support. Right. So a, a third potential challenge I've seen at sites is related to change management for implementing new ground control measures. So components of this may include effective communication and education for, for a new ground control measure, ensuring that you have buy-in from your different stakeholders um, so that they, they understand and, and wanna, want to follow through with the implementation of it. And finally, following through uh, with implementation. So some solutions that, that I, I've taken part for, for this type of challenge includes providing a formal change management training to your staff and implementing that process for, for any ground control changes. And so some companies ha have a formal process for this and, and can provide the, this type of training. 
A second one would be to make sure you're hiring ground control staff who are proactive communicators with different stakeholders. So that this would be someone who, who's not afraid to go underground and spend time with your, your different groups at the site, um, who's willing to give presentations to, to crews when a change is implemented. And uh, the, the final solution would be conducting ongoing inspections and audits for, for implementation and per performing a follow-up if it isn't being implemented properly. Yep. I think I'm good for examples. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I think that was that was great, Anna. I really appreciate that. I, I actually I like, you know, the last two that you had. I think there's a little bit of a, an opportunity for sharing in there. You, you mentioned secondments, but even mm -hmm. just getting out to visit other operations and see best practices from a ground control aspect, I think are so valuable. And if you tie that in with the change management, you know, if you're looking to implement a new ground control technology that's new to you likely unless you're you know the pioneer it's being done somewhere else in the industry and and getting there visiting it seeing how it's used talking to the people that implemented it or seeing what they did for change management i think you know those are great shares to help overcome some of the problems with change management that occur whether it's ground control or other other aspects in our industry oh absolutely Great. Maybe Kathy or Ryan, anything you know you'd like to add to to what Anna started off here on this uh, on look just looking at the industry and some specific opportunities. I think Anna, you've hit a serious challenge bang on there, and it, it challenged not just in in ground control. It's it's throughout our mining industry. Is you mm -hmm. know there seems to be a people deficit and not not enough people getting in into the industry and and lots of the gray hairs read retiring and we don't have all the replacements. So definitely see that issue in projects that I've worked on. And and happily, I've seen you, Anna, at one of our projects uh, doing some great work and, and, and helping a uh, team that was struggling with, with some resources and, and you were able to to join the team and, and really help them out. So, you know, I've seen that, that firsthand. Um, another, I think, I don't know if it's, a well-defined solution, but something that I'm seeing maybe a bit more as geotechnical review boards mm -hmm. and where very senior, very experienced people are are going to various sites and reviewing their, their ground control programs. And, you know, I think back when I was a very young engineer and I remember preparing and participating in review, and I just learned so much in such a short time. And, and then also, you know, meeting these very experienced people who are then mentors for for young engineers. So I think the the use of re review boards, I think mining companies love it because you know it's a way that they're managing the risk by getting people in to review stuff. But there's a, there's benefits beyond that and benefits to to helping our our issue with uh, with a scarcity of of uh, ground ground control workers that can really help help train them. So uh, thank you, Anna. Some some good points there. For sure. Oh, thanks, Ryan. <clears throat> I, I really echo everything that Anna and Ryan just said. And, and Ryan, I like your comments on geotechnical review boards. Um, one, for making sure that the engineering processes and everything are, are um, well done, but also for that mentoring component, absolutely. Um, I guess one additional point that I would say can be a challenge in ground control and, and managing ground control programs is citing corporate culture for safety. Um, poor safety culture can be a huge barrier in successful execution of a ground control management program. So solutions for this are obviously developing site-wide and, and corporate or company-wide um, positive safety culture that's putting safety over production. And, mm -hmm. and that's a huge asset to, to ground control engineers. It's a nice tool to have in our back pocket. Yeah. Kathy, I think you make a, a great point on the safety culture. You know, it applies to so much. And when you think about, you know, geotechnical, if that safety culture isn't there, you know, the, the geotechnical people are not going to want to stick around. They're putting themselves at risk, you know, through you know, decisions they make that aren't getting implemented. And so then it, it perpetuates into a situation that gets worse and worse just with the, the quality of people that are being brought in because 
know, stronger people don't want to stay because they see the cultures that's there. You get the turnover that Anna said that becomes even so much worse in those situations. And so mm -hmm. I definitely agree with you. The safety culture is just a key aspect of, of some of the things that are critical to, to safety overall and geotechnical is, is no different. Um, but maybe, Michelle, we can talk about some other aspects and see what the audience has to say if we, uh, if we get into our first poll question. And so, you know, we'll open it up to the audience now for the poll questions. As you see, you can you can just select what you want. Um, but maybe from your perspective, which aspect of ground control do you believe is the most critical to, to safety? And, and again, please select only one. Is it regular monitoring of the ground condition, proper scaling of loops from the roof and walls, implementing predictive analysis technology, or effective communication between all team members? And so, um, you know, just we'll run it through the polls, please. Please answer the questions if you see fit, and we'll we'll give it a couple of minutes for the, the teams to to fill it out. Just as the individuals are selecting that, um, I do like the comments you're making about uh, you know the the review boards, and you know from my experience, uh, quite a bit on the tailings as, as incidents have occurred, but seeing a sum in in ground control, uh, but mostly for specific aspects of the mine, whether it's high seismicity or, or other ones. Um, maybe for the other three panelists, just as we're we're going through the questions, it, have you seen just general, you know, mines or operations that that get these review boards just on ongoing basis versus for specific uh, for specific concerns that are, that are occurring at mines? And any thoughts or ideas that you could share? Because I think it's very valuable for our audience on on this aspect. Yeah, I think it's mixed, right? As you say, there are um, review boards that are very specifically focused on incidents or as you say, like seismic review boards, quite common. Um, but there are a lot of operations worldwide that are moving to more general geotechnical review boards that are coming in and looking at the entire ground control program, how is design being conducted, um, how is design being executed? What are the competencies of, of team members? Like covering all aspects of, of geotechnical and ground control programs. Great. No, I think that you know this is the best practice off the off the bat. Just sharing it with the with the listeners there. If if you've got an operation or organization or or even a project that's starting up, think about how you put these uh, these review boards in place. So we'll get back to the questions, and it's uh, it looks like it's almost a draw, a toss up between regularly monitoring of the ground conditions and effective communication between all team members. And I, and I think you know communication is always a key aspect. Another one, and uh, you know, Kathy, you brought this up before. Training also another key aspect as well that we'll we'll sort of touch on briefly in some of the other questions. But I I think this is really important, and it's monitoring the ground conditions. Um, to see what's going on, how to react, and, and what's taking place. Um, but I think, you know, thanks, Michelle, for the question and for the audience for the response. Um, with monitoring of what's taking place and looking back and, and adding to it, I think the other aspect that's important is proactively analyzing what can we do from a safety perspective and how do we set up a safety and ground controlled strategy um, to look at potential hazards before they occur. Obviously, you're monitoring the field, but you know, are there any instances, and maybe Kathy, I'll, I'll start out with you, um, where you saw a proactive controlled strategy for ground control being very effective and, and the impacts of that? Yeah, sure. Um, I guess an easy one would be like hire good, hire good people, but <laughs> but that's, that's too much of an easy answer. So maybe we should get a bit more technical. Um, I think a, a critical component of proactive ground control is really about minimizing our exposure to deteriorating ground conditions in our excavations and damage accumulation in our ground support systems. Um, we need to manage these in order to mitigate vulnerability um, of our operations to excavation damage. And when we allow the conditions in an excavation to deteriorate and we don't manage the damage accumulation in our support systems, we're really moving towards a place where our workplaces have elevated safety risk, right? So consider, I suppose we could say, um, ground support systems are designed with, as an example, prescribed bolt capacity, right? So when we're designing a ground support system or if we're evaluating the effectiveness of of a, as installed ground support system. We need to be thinking about how that 
support system capacity may be changing over time. And there's lots of different factors that can impact the capacity of our support system over time. And I can show you a few examples. Um, Michelle, can you please share my first slide? Great, um, thanks. So here is uh, three different photos. These are all photos that are taken in the same mine with the same ground conditions and the same stress conditions. Um, but the difference between all of these photos is the age of the excavation. Okay, so if you look at the photo in the top um, left hand corner, you can see that the rock mass, it appears to be fairly competent. The excavation's in pretty good shape. And at, at first glance, a lot of people may look at this and, and conclude that this really light split set support system is appropriate for these conditions. But then if we look at the photo in the center of the screen and on the bottom right hand side of the screen, we see excavations that are taking on um, an increasing amount of damage. And that damage is developing gradually over a long period of time. So it could be months or it could be years. And when we let our excavations deteriorate like this, we have a rock mass that is bulking. We have fractures that are dilating. And so, um, for example, we're losing confinement on our individual rock bolts, right? And when we lose confinement on our rock bolts, we lose bond strength and we can no longer mobilize the full strength of the bolts as they have been designed to do. We don't have the capacity of the system that we put into our engineering designs, okay? Another example um, is stress loading uh, in fairly competent rock conditions. And thanks for changing the slide there, Michelle. Um, these are some photos showing evidence of rock bolt loading. Okay, so we can see the face plates are bent. I'm sure that many of the people online today have, have seen things like this and are familiar with it. Um, when conditions like this are observed, but none of the rock bolts are actually physically broken, sometimes there is false confidence that our support system is effective, right? It's taking load, but nothing's breaking. But what we need to take into consideration is that as the steel in these rock bolts is stretching, we're losing strength, okay? So now we have a ground support system that doesn't have the same capacity as it was initially um, been designed to, to accommodate. So coming back to your question, how do we use like proactive strategies to improve safety? There's two different aspects um, in terms of design and, and maintenance of ground support systems. First of all, we need to design ground support systems for long-term excavation maintenance. And in some cases, this um, can lead to a misconception that ground support systems are too conservative during initial development because the excavation looks really good <laughs> until damage starts to accumulate. Um, and in some cases that damage accumulations could be months or even years later, right? The, the ramp might look wonderful for the first three years of operations and then all of a sudden everything starts falling apart because of that, that time dependency. In the mine that I illustrated in my first slide there, um, they actually went back and changed their ground support standards to implement a more robust ground support standard for this type of ground conditions so that they could do a better job proactively managing all of their future development. And the second component of being proactive is around preventative maintenance. So ground support systems should be prescribed preventative maintenance in the same sort of fashion as we prescribe preventative maintenance for our equipment, our mining equipment. Um, for scenarios like my second set of photos where we've got bolts taking load, um, we can use monitoring tools in order to identify early ground deformations and that provides a really critical input to assess ground support loading and to make decisions on how to um, uh, reestablish full capacity of our support system before damage happens. So we're doing prehabilitation rather than rehabilitation after the excavation has already incurred maybe a fall of ground or, or damage. So, I guess I don't want my answers to come across as advocating for, you know, really conservative design and really conservative rehabilitation practices. These proactive ground support strategies are absolutely critical for maintaining operational safety um, related to ground control hazards, but they also have to be optimized so that we're balancing um, cost and productivity risks at the same time. The design decisions 
around proactive ground support strategies really has to be technically justified. And so we're leaning on our engineering teams. Hopefully they have good mentors. Hopefully there's some good review board people providing input uh, to make sure that we're not going above and beyond, but we have an optimized solution for, for proactive strategies. No, excellent. Thanks, Kathy. And you've increased my uh, vocabulary today with the word prehabilitation. So I, I like that. I'm all I'm all set now. So thanks for that. But but you make a you know, you make a good point, and it's unfortunate because often when you think about ground control, either there's a failure and you see that the system wasn't designed adequately, or if there's no failure, people say, well, maybe it's over designed. Like you, you can't truly say it's a it's a good design because you'll always get questioned. Well, maybe you're over conservative, and it's how do you how do you hit that fine balance, right, of of how you put systems in place? And and I really like you know when you talk about proactive. Proactive is actually setting up a maintenance strategy for the ground, like you do with any other equipment that you have underground. And and so I think that's a tremendous idea around proactive safety is also a maintenance strategy for the openings, for the drifts, for the support observations. Maybe Anna, Ryan, anything else you'd like to add uh, on, on what you've seen or your experience? I, I have a good example I can share. You know, as a contractor, we're often the first ones in developing the, the, the shaft, the, the first ex excavations, and, and often geotechnical monitoring follows behind. Um, so we're not getting the info for our initial stuff. It, it follows and it's well set up by the time production starts. Um, but to be a little more pro, pro, proactive, we recently uh, finished a, uh, actually the deepest shaft in, in the Sudbury Basin. And uh, you know, hard, brittle rock, high stress conditions, very bursty ground. And a very proactive strategy that uh, the, the owner, Glencore, took was to install seismic monitoring sensors in, in boreholes well in advance of our excavation. And you know this gave them a lot of high quality data right on the onset, and that allowed them to, to respond to, uh, to what they're seeing and, and plan some, some other proactive strategies such as the pre-preconditioning program that was implemented, and then allowed them to really, you know, I don't know if optimize is the right word, but really see how it was working and, you know, change that design if, if and as, as needed. So having that very proactive installation of the micro seismic system using, I think, very novel technology, at least for the mining industry, you know, is piggybacking on some of the, the remote stuff done for micro seismics in the, in, in the oil industry. Um, so lots of good lessons learned and pro proactive work on that. And, you know, the industry is really fortunate. Glencore has, you know, shared a lot of those lessons learned, and you know, thanks to Alex Hall and Brad Simser, they've they've published stuff and presented to the CIM on on those lessons learned. And and I think, you know, as an industry, we we need to look at the the work that are done there and see if it makes sense for for any and all all projects. Certainly, going into new bursting ground, I think this is technology that that really needs to be uh, pro proactive stuff that needs to be done. Yeah, thank, thanks, Ryan. Anna, anything to add? Uh, John, I, I think I'd like to to give an example from, from a project that, that I've been involved with at Rock Eng in the past year. Um, so, so a specific example I could think of of a proactive ground control strategy um, well, was a, at a project in Mexico that I was involved with where Rock Eng was asked to perform a ground support audit at the, this particular site, they they conducted some early mine development, but but weren't weren't in production yet. And the the objectives of this op audit was to optimize their ground support design going forward. And I I would consider this a, a proactive strategy because often sites skip this step until a large amount of development is in place, and they they don't want to use resources to do it until they they realize they have a problem. Um, so the, the site had already conducted a fairly rigorous feasibility stage support design, which had included collecting a great deal of site characterization for, from the drilling stage. So I, when I became involved during the, the early mine development, I conducted an audit to assess if any adjustments were, were needed to the support before too much mine development was in place. So the, 
the components that I was involved with included reviewing the, the existing site characterization and the, the preliminary support design, along with some additional data that the site had been collecting, including observations and some geotechnical mapping from the tunnels. After this, I, I followed up with a, a site visit to make some of my own observations and collect verification data of the actual conditions, as well as the, the support performance and excavations. And I, I used the, these observations and additional data to update the support design, as well as provide some recommendations for oper operational procedures as necessary. So to, just to give some examples of the, the types of optimization that we recommended, um, we recommended tightening the bolt spacing based on the observed jointing in the tunnels, as well as the, the site was starting to, to see some bagging already in the mesh. And we, we also recommended increasing the use of shock rate and some of the, the weaker altered dikes that, that were starting to show deterioration. And, as well as reducing the bit size for the, the rebar bolt installations because it, it was noticed that the, the bolt holes were getting over drilled and many of the bolts were, were failing during pull testing. Um, so we, as I mentioned, uh, sites often skip this optimization step until there, there's a, a, lot, a lot of development already in place. Uh, often they're already in production. However, if they find that the, the original support design was not appropriate, they may have safety hazards and either need to perform a lot of rehab um, later at a later stage in mining, or uh, as Kathy touched on, the, the original support may, may have been overly conservative. So consequently, there, there are potential cost savings and safety benefits to verify your conditions and optimize your support design. Um, before too much underground development has been mined. Yeah, perfect. Uh, thanks, Anna. And mm -hmm. you know, I'll just add from from my operations background a couple points to to what Kathy said, and I think are are very valuable. Um, one of the things that uh, at my previous work that we did with an asset perform an asset integrity database we had, and when you think about asset integrity, you think about fixed infrastructure, you think of metal and steel. Um, but actually thinking about openings and excavations as asset integrity and putting it on that list and making sure you've got that with regular maintain, you know, regular maintenance, regular inspections, I think is a critical aspect to, to do as well that fits right into what you're saying. <clears throat> and the other thing I, I found very valuable when doing risk registries or risk assessments with development, um, and again, it's, it's a, what your basis of, but when you look at the impact of it and the costs, factoring in if you have to go back and recondition these areas or do you know rehabilitation what's the impact to production in that rehabilitation and, and quite often that analysis will make some headings require a higher support system just because if you had to go back the impact that would have to your production to your operation would be substantial versus some other areas that aren't in the way that cost isn't as bad so you, you know you're a little bit more um more flexible in the support that you're providing so just a couple of, of experiences that I've seen as far as safety opportunities. And, and maybe with that, Michelle, we'll turn it over to, to the back to the uh, the audience again and, and thinking about opportunities to improve safety. You know, what have they seen or what do they feel could provide the largest with respect to ground control practices? It, you know, is it safer installation methods and equipment innovations? Is it a better ground support products? Is it more strategic stability improvements in the overall global mine design? Or is it implementing geotechnical and seismic monitoring and control the, more in the practice and the operations themselves? And so we'll just give some time for for the uh, for the audience to respond to those and, and bring them in. I, I want to touch on you know a couple a couple of the last questions really got into to coaching or, or mentoring and you know the generation gap of what's happening and the experience. You know, from the three of you on the panel, what have you saw that has been successful for coaching some of these younger engineers, younger ground control specialists to, to help them be ready, you know, as they progress through their careers? Is there any examples or any advice you could give to the listeners, um, you know, whether it's coaching ground control people specifically for this, but, but just in general, is there anything that you've seen that you think would be valuable? I, I guess I could jump in on that. Um, a lot of sites that I've been at lately have really young engineering teams. Anna touched on this 
um, earlier today. And there's not necessarily in-house mentoring opportunities for young ground control engineers, particularly for our mid-tier and small mining companies. Like they're, they're really big majors have corporate people and multiple operations that they can draw a network on. But for some of the mid-tier operators and smaller operators, there's not always internal mentoring opportunities. And so I have seen um, increased reliance on, I guess, seconding senior level um, experts to come in and provide training, to provide main, um, mentoring, be available for um, you know teams meetings to to talk about design decisions, um, doing inspections together, all of these things to kind of transfer transfer knowledge when it's not necessarily available in house, depending on the size of a a site's particular team. Oh, great, thanks, Kathy. I mean, I I think the other thing for me again, you've got the the geotechnical coaching that's specific. But I think just in general, where you've got strong and qualified geotechnical people with that knowledge, it might even be coaching them on how to coach others. Because because sometimes people that are very strong technically, e even in large organizations where you got the corporate support, they're very good at the technical aspects. But coaching others and developing others are important. So it's it's important to get you know these these ground control people to be able to coach others. But for those that aren't ground control experts helping mm -hmm. them realize that the coaching is the opportunity, how to be better coaches so that they are developing the younger ground control engineers, the younger rock mechanics engineers, I think is, is so critical overall. Um, so even if you're not a, a geotechnical expert, work and you're, and you're in relating with one or dealing with one, work with them to become better coaches or coach them on how to ask questions, but coach them on how to be better coaches because I think we need that as an industry as a whole. And, and I go back to the, you know, the, the, the review committees as being a great opportunity as well too that I never even thought of. So thanks for bringing that up in the first question. And I think a lot of the mentoring or not, I'm sorry, all of the mentoring doesn't have to come from a geotechnical or rock mechanics expert. There is a huge amount of mentoring that we can give young engineers by having them spend time underground with operations personnel, right? Like yeah, doing yeah. rounds with underground supervisors, spending time on the equipment, getting that exposure mm -hmm. to underground. So it's really important that the managers of engineering departments are giving their people that opportunity to interact with the operations end of, end of learning as well. That's an excellent point, Kathy, 100%. Mm -hmm. That, uh, you know, that needs to be something at every mine where, where uh, young technical people are, are getting good exposure to operations and, and, you know, meeting the miners who are dealing with the rock every day and, and learning to interpret what they're seeing and what feedback you can get from them. Yeah. Because some of that feedback is, is very critical to uh, some of the decisions made for, for ground, ground control. So great point. And I saw Michelle had the survey results up, and we got a tie again. I, I tell you, we we ask great questions and we give great responses here. But you know, I, I think it is really important with strategic stability in the mines and implementing the control systems. It, it's like you know, the the last question three and four lead into one another of setting up that strategic plan and then implementing it and monitoring it to make sure it's successful. Um, you know, the, the first question in that, which, which which landed third, but not by that much, was really about the SIG for installation and equipment methods. And and maybe I'll just, with that, Ryan, turn, turn it over to you, because I know you've done lots of work on looking at implementation techniques and methods, and what does that mean? What does that do to the industry as a whole? And, and maybe you'd like to share your thoughts on that or, or other things around methodology that you'd, uh, you'd like to share. Sure, great. Uh, thank, thanks, John. So, yeah, like the, the basis for ground control is we want to secure the ground for the safety of the workplace, but we also have to think about while we're doing that, securing the ground, the, the safety of the workplace. So uh, I think 26% was on, you know, safe, uh, that, that poll was on safe uh, practices for, for in, installing ground support. So recently I've been compiling data from uh, from cementation's experience in doing lateral development and in installing ground support 
just to, to, to look at different methodologies of ground support installation and, and where we have incidents. So the, the slide that's up now, there's, there's a map there. All the dots are uh, places where we've had projects in North America uh, from 2010 to, to 2023. So, you know, very diverse types of mine, geology, ground mm -hmm. conditions, and wide, wide range of ground support installation. And in that time, we've, uh, we've installed ground support over 304 kilometers of, of tunnel drift uh, development. You know, this is just lateral development, not, not, not shaft work. And you know, breaking that down, how are we putting the bolts in? You know, 43 kilometers of that is using handheld drills. So using the same methods that we maybe used in the 1950s when we were first, first doing rock, rock bolting. Um, Semi-mechanized, you know, that's in, in Canada, that's to me that that's a McLean bolter where we've taken the drill out of somebody's mm -hmm. hands. So we're we're eliminating those hazards, but the miner's still there feeding the bolts, uh, working right with the drill, versus fully mechanized, and that's that's boom, boom bolters. Uh, uh, you know, and so in this 14-year time period, you know, uh, almost two thirds of the work we've done is using uh, these fully mechanized methods. So if we can go to the next slide, I've just summarized our uh, safety incidents by each of these, these methods. And you know, qualitatively, we can do a, a risk assessment or a safety assessment of, of the different methods. And we always think, you know, they're probably more likely to have incidents with handheld mechanized is, is the way to go. No, we can do those risk assessment. It shows that, but I'm not sure who's actually collected the data to 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 prove that. So it was very lucky. Our managing director wanted us to do this study and 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 publish this these these data to to really show. So you know, this is almost a million feet of of development in total. These are the number of incidents we've we've had. Um, and secondly, you know. We did a lot more with mechanized, so we want to try to normalize it. So the the, the numbers work to normalize to to 10 kilometers or 10,000 meters, and com compare the stats. Then, big thing that we see right off the bat: zero lost time incidents on mechanized bolting. So no, that's 14 years of experience, uh, 190 kilometers of and zero lost time. So no, that that really stands out. If we look at medically treated uh, incidents uh, where we have to get some sort of medical treatment done, doesn't result in a lost time. If we look at the numbers per 10,000 10, meters there, it's, it's really dramatic. The, we have 16 basically incidents per 10,000 meters. Then we go to semi-mechanized and, you know, we've an order of magnitude better we're doing with that and then mechanize another order of magnitude so you know this data like if, if you're planning a mine planning your ground support installation this data shows maybe what we all suspected that the mechanized fully mechanized methods are the are the way to go and if we can avoid using handheld and we can't always avoid uh you know there, there's reasons why we can't fully mechanize uh, uh everything uh right now but uh you know, certainly where, where we can, we need to, uh, the, the whole industry needs to move that, that way. And the industry is, I mean, there's OEMs, there's new OEMs making mechanized bolting equipment now, there's new products coming out. So there's been lots of activity in this sector, uh, lots in, in the last five years. And I see lots of movement in the next five years where we're really increasing the the technology to uh, to mechanize our, our our bolting, you know, like we've been bolting remotely, for instance, you know, not not even in the drift for eight or ten years, and and the OEMs are now getting in on that, and you know, we'll probably be bolting from surface sometime soon, and and the the, the carriages that you know you can now put 40, 50 bolts on, so you can do a whole round knot there. Uh, there's there's lots of exciting developments in this field. Uh, McLean is putting a robot on to do all the work that the, the miner did. So uh, all this tech technology that's that's coming and, and new rock bolts that work well with this. The knock on mechanized bolting in the past is it's 
been difficult to put resin rebar in with it. You know, so if that's your needed ground support or any of the, the resin products, that's been a struggle in the past, but we're getting over those struggles. So, mm -hmm. uh, so and if like we, we did a bunch more work on this, just showed a couple slides here. And certainly if if anybody out there, we, we want to share this data. We we want to make our industry safer. So please get a hold of me if if anybody wants to know more about this uh, this study that that we've done looking at this these these data. So. Yeah, Ryan, and we appreciate you sharing the data. I mean, it's terrific to actually see hard numbers, see the results, and and it it comes together very well and, and tells a tells quite the story when you look at it. So thank you. And maybe Kathy or Anna, whether it's emerging technologies in the implementation of ground support or any other emerging technologies in, in the ground support, ground control and rock mechanics areas, anything top of your mind that you think is, is good to share with the audience? Uh, John, uh, the technology that, that I can think of that, that I've seen in my career that can en enhance ground control safety practices would be improve geotechnical monitoring and implementation. So even today, many sites still lack real-time geotechnical instrument monitoring for, for their ground control hazards. However, I, I've noticed in the past five to 10 years, I, I've seen some big improvements in terms of underground networks and communications that, that are enabling mine-wide real-time data transfer for, for geotechnical instrumentation data. Uh, in addition to this, I, I've also seen some advancements in the, the type of instrumentation that, that's available um, that, that's been, been coming out in recent years. So a, a specific example I could think of is the increased use of LIDAR scanners underground, but both for surveying as well as measuring displacements and underground excavations. Um, it seems to be getting more and more common that, that these are replacing CMS units for, for scanning stopes when, when they're mounted on a drone. And I, I believe that the, the increased adoption of both real-time monitoring as well as these new in, innovations in monitoring that, that are being adopted should allow for better understanding but both of your ground behavior overall because they're, they're providing us with a, a more complete and better data set in order to, to make decisions as well as manage your geotechnical risk. Thanks, Anna. I'll, I'll jump in and add one more thing um, around emerging technologies. And I guess, I, I don't know what the right phrase is, but digital access to information. And, and I mean this in terms of what information our operations people are receiving. So I've been seeing, I have been seeing in recent years, increased utilization of tablets and of cell phones by not only the technical services people but also by the operations people so for example when you've got the prints on a tablet and they're automatically synced to your engineering um, document control systems there's no excuse for having a, an out-of-date drill design or an out-of-date cable bolting package um because it's automatically updated and design changes happen like that's normal in a dynamic mining environment but now we can make sure that our operations people have immediate access to anything that's changing upstairs in the the offices right another component of automated access to information is accessing seismic data through cell phones and tablets right a large seismic event happens in the mine and nearly instantaneously you know all of the the supervisors and everybody can see on their cell phones where that seismic event was they don't have to radio up to dispatch or they don't need to find the ground control engineer to check the seismic system because this type of digital communication is is really advancing at a, at a nice rapid pace and it, it makes ops safer oh, great and you know I, I think we're going to jump right into the questions because we've got a bunch already which means great great presentations to generate this from the audience, but one of them has to do with the data collection. Um, and, you know, it's a, a comment slash question in here, but it sort of says we're getting much better at data collection and more frequently. Um, but what about interpretation? What do we need to do? And are we actually progressing as much with data interpretation as we are with data collection? I, I think, you know, if I, if my experience in working at Creighton for quite a while, your, your comment around the micro seismic that's some interpretation because now you can see where things are going you can interpretate the trends like that was a great example of where you can have more data and and the interpretation go along with it but maybe for the team here with with more data 
has the interpretation improved as well too? And is there a benefit? Your your thoughts on that? Anyone want to jump in on that one with that interpretation? It's a, so something that that I've seen, John, that that at least ha helps with the the data interpretation, but in terms of having larger and more data sets, is that it seems like some of the, the software tools that, that are available for interpreting that data ha have improved. Um, an example that that I could think of is uh, all the, the different tools that, that are available in LeapFrog for, for viewing geotechnical data. Um, but when I started out or earlier in my career, um, LeapFrog, or, or at least LeapFrog in its current form, what wasn't available, and now it's much easier to view, view geotechnical data sets spatially, uh, all in the same location, uh, along with your mind designs. Thanks, Anne, and, and I think the comment's valid. You know, as we collect more data, how do we make sure that we do the interpretation of that and we, we gain the value out of that data versus getting buried in the data and maybe being less effective from it overall? The other thing that I see spurred a couple questions was on the development of the ground control engineers. And, you know, we mentioned part of the coaching doesn't have to be from ground control engineers. It's getting into the into the field, getting into the workplace, talking with the miners. Um, any ideas on how to make that happen? Anything you've seen in your career or that you've been experienced with that made it successful or engaged the miner, the, the geotech younger ones to get underground? What, what can we do to make sure this is more frequent? Uh, and when they're underground, using it as a learning uh, experience. Any thoughts from the from the panel? I think that that needs to be um, part of their training, that it is an expectation that they're spending a lot of time underground, right, as part of their job description. Uh, like a ground control management plan, a, a main component of having a ground control management plan is it is the how-to guide for your young ground control person to do their day-to-day -day job, right? It has everything laid out in there. And part of that is, what are we inspecting? How often are we inspecting? Are we doing job observations? So having a really strong ground control management program in place sets out those expectations that new staff and, and new engineers are getting underground to do, to do that. And then, as I think I mentioned earlier, making sure they have time in their like make sure you have resource allocation that there is time to do that because it can be really overwhelming you know developing plans and prints and running numerical models and doing all of these desk-based engineering jobs that we need to do but as managers of technical services teams we need to make sure that we have the people resources and the time resources that allow them to get underground at least once a week mm -hmm. one kind of practical thing that that I've had is having a good engineering office underground. So when you're underground, you have a, a good spot to go and do some of that desk work if there's downtime, if the cage is down and you're you're trapped underground want or not trapped, but waiting <laughs> underground. Uh, and so you you can be productive and, and have access to all of your systems that you would in your office on surface in the uh, in the underground environment so i one operation i was lucky to have such an office and you know it made spending most of the week underground easy because i could still do all of that work underground that i might be doing on on surface and i, I think the next question actually leads into another opportunity of how to how to get people and you know young engineers underground more often you know it's around how do you empower the young engineers to feel comfortable asking questions and, and to gain knowledge through decision making, feeling instead like they're the ones that need to be giving all the answers and, and need to be, you know, have the answers available. And so the question was about empowering them to feel comfortable to ask questions in helping them make decisions. And I think that's part of some of the reluctance to go underground is that they don't see it as an opportunity to learn and to gain things. They're concerned that they have to be giving all the answers and there's going to be pressure when they go underground to be the responders. And some of it is actually learning and asking questions. And I think that's what you need to do to, to engage them. It's a learning opportunity and gaining people you can get knowledge from it. Um, you know, so the question is, how do you actually empower the young engineers to ask questions from operations people, from other engineers, from outside the organization to to help them gain in their decision-making abilities. Any any experience or thoughts on that? 
I think one thing that stands out for me is I see a lot of ground control engineers, they see that pressure, right? They're underground, they're at the face, and it's like, okay, what do we do now, right? And fostering an environment where it's okay to say, I'm going to take some measurements, and then I'm going to go and do some calculations, and then I'm going to give you the answer before I go home today, rather than trying to make a call on the fly. Because I see ground control engineers fall into that tendency where they're like, they need to have an answer right now before they even leave the, the workplace. Um, and that has to be a top down um, culture that's enforced where it's okay to stop and think and, and get them an hour, like the information in an hour or in two hours, uh, you know, still within reasonable time frames, but let them stop and think and do some math. <laughs> Great. Other comments or I'll move on to the next question? I think as a uh, maybe a senior engineer on a site to model that that behavior. And when I was first working underground, I had a uh, a supervisor who had 40 plus years of experience working underground. And he'd go down and look at stuff. And then he'd say he needed to go confer and he'd come and talk to me who was brand new. And you know, so he was modeling some good behavior to me, but and, and also, you know, it was basically just a sanity check to run it past someone else. And you know, we need to be doing that on on important decisions. It was also great learning for for me, but there was multiple steps there that it wasn't just discussing the issue. We, with modeling good behavior and and you know making the operations team know that these decisions do take a bit of time and we need to get it right. You know. Perfect. Actually, to, sorry to to add to to that, John. Um, I I can think of a a site that I that I worked at where they they have like an organized inspection um, that was always the same day of the week. At, and it, it was led by by one of the operations supervisors and any of the engineers um, it, the the technical services team was welcome to to join including ground control and i i found that that was um re really nice because you well a you, you you could ask anyone on the engineering team what while you were underground if you were unsure about some other component of, of the design as well as discuss with with this operations supervisor and uh, that way you know if you if you're unsure about something you you could discuss it with your team and then put follow up afterwards okay perfect thanks We'll take one more question. The list is long and we'll work to answer them and we'll send them back to the, the people that asked them. But uh, I like this one and it ties into our first poll question. You know, one of them was around all communications by the entire team on, on ground control. And so really quick, um, any thoughts that the three of you have on how do you get conversations amongst everybody, not just the people with PhDs and masters around geotechnical, how do you get everybody in the workplace to be having a, a conversation on ground support and make it common practice when it's not the ground support people that are around? Anything you could share with the, the listeners as one last comment? And I'll, you know, I'll I'll take it because I don't I'm not a ground control expert and I don't have a, a master's degree I do in business but not in anything technical, but I think one of the things for me when I was in operations it is just asking the question like asking people and you know as I was a superintendent or manager traveling with my superintendents or supervisors and and talking to the the bolters the people on the drills asking them what the conditions are like what are they thinking and and modeling that behavior in front of other leaders so that the supervisors take that on as a conversation they have regularly so yeah. that's a little tidbit i'll have and turn it over i think that's it right it's it's having the ground control presence in the lineup meetings in the morning that should be an expectation at any operation is that your ground control person is attending the lineup meetings in the morning right um making sure that those open communications are positive underground right um it's one thing to say like here's our design build it right but it's another thing to say like here's our design and and this is why i made the decisions and you don't need to explain those decisions and like PhD level technical terms, right? Like 
you have to be, to be a good engineer, you need to be able to communicate your, your technical decisions to a non-technical audience. And then you start building trust. And as soon as you start building trust, then you start building positive conversations and you get really nice two directional like information flow. Perfect. Thanks, Kathy. And communication always is in words. It could be like Michelle popping up on the screen to say, our time is up. So let's close it off. So, sorry to Anna and Ryan, not to give you a chance, let you wrap it up. Thanks, John. And thank you, Kathy, Anna, and Ryan. And also a special thanks to B2Bold for sponsoring today's episode of the Safety Share. I'd like to thank all of our attendees and ask that you please fill out the short survey that pops up on your screen at the close of the webinar. A link to the video recording of this webinar will be emailed to you tomorrow afternoon. We hope you will uh, join us for the next episode of the Safety Share on June 20th at 1 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, where we'll discuss from a safety perspective the pros and cons of battery electric vehicles. We hope to see you there and enjoy and, and please enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye. Thanks again, everyone. Enjoy your day.